Frank, the fine tuning of this universe has everybody energized talking about it, what it means. The so-called anthropic principle, a lot of people confuse with fine tuning. There's mm. two separate, radically different uh, approaches. Anthropic principles used to try to explain fine tuning. You've taken a very interesting approach to this fine tuning by giving us some concepts to think about. You talk about enlightenment and knowledge and ignorance and then temptation. Yes. <laughs> how, how does that help us with fine tuning? Well, in our present formulation of the laws of physics and cosmology, uh, we have to put in some numbers, parameters, they're called, to, to get the description of uh, our universe. And uh, at the discussion is about the parameters that we don't know how to constrain or determine from fundamental dynamical or symmetry principles. So I thought it was very useful and informative to classify these different parameters. So we know what we're talking about. A lot of discussions of anthropic principles and fine tuning get very vague. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was very proud. I made this four-part classification of, of the different things. So there, there are uh, two different questions you can ask about a, one of these they, about a parameter that appears. You can ask, is it important for the emergence of life, or not? Some of them don't matter. The mass of the top quark, for instance, is only very, very indirectly connected to anything about life. Um, and the other question you can ask is, do we have a good idea about why it might be constrained or not? So those are two questions. You can answer yes or no to either one. That makes four, four possibilities. possibilities. <laughs> All right. So one class of things is uh, things that are important to life, and we have a pretty good idea of why, how we might explain them in terms of fundamental ideas. That I call enlightenment, because we're learning about something that's really important to the structure of the world and life as we know it. Uh, another class is things that aren't important to life, that we have good ideas about, that I call knowledge. It's good to know, but not crucial for, for most purposes. Uh, then there's another class of things that aren't important for life, and we also don't know how to explain it. <laughs> and that's just ignorance. ignorance. Like the mass of the top quark that I mentioned is an example of ignorance. Just, we don't know and it doesn't matter. It, we don't know and, well, it, it, does, it, it doesn't matters matter. if you want it to matter, but if you, don't, if you just want to get on with life and do chemistry <laughs> and, <laughs> right, right. and explain uh, things of, most things about the natural world, it, Probably and to have a natural world and that to exists. to have a natural world in more or less the form we know, right. it probably doesn't matter so much exactly what the mass of the top quark is. Uh, and then finally, there's this class of thing that are very important for life, and we don't know a fundamental explanation or have a good idea even for what a, fu a fundamental explanation for why they have the values they do. And some of these are have to be quite precise in order for things not to go badly wrong. And that's your ignorance category. That, no, that, the temptation. that's the temptation. That's temptation. Right, right, right. Because for those things, there's a temptation to say the reason they have the values they do is that if they didn't, we wouldn't exist. And that temptation can be taken either of two ways. That's say, our existence is the central fact of the world, so that determines the physical laws. Or another slightly more modest and <laughs> reasonable version of it is that uh, uh, there could be alternative places in the universe or alternative universes in which they had different values, but we couldn't live in such a world. So forget it. You know, it's just, it, it, so you explain why it has the values of the, it does because there could be other values, but there's no one then that could observe it. We use that kind of explanation all the time. Like if we want to say, uh, gee, the universe is huge. Why, why do we live on this tiny planet that's so atypical? You know, <laughs> interstellar space is mostly not like that. The sun is much bigger. Why couldn't we live there? And it's just because, of course, it's inhospitable to life. So, so that explains why we live on the earth. Uh, so the question is, do we 
succumb to the temptation to uh, explain the loose ends, the remaining parameters of our standard models of physics and cosmology in terms of this selection principle or anthropic principle, if you like. And uh, maybe we'll have to, but it's, uh, it's quite a come down from the kind of precise, fruitful, essentially mathematical explanation of things that we've, that has sort of been the gold standard in theoretical physics and our inspiration for a long time. Your lament, I think, is something like, then fundamental physics would go out like a... Like a whimper. Like a Not whimper. with a bang, but with a whimper. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be reduced to saying, oh, well, that's selection. And that can never be made very precise because... Uh, you know, for practical purposes, we only get to sample one universe. So even if there are other ones with different values and we could predict the statistical distribution, that doesn't help us very much with, sure. with anything observable. Uh, uh, people can make an argument, and I might agree, that uh, to, to, to have the temptation uh, a, a quartile of your, of your matrix right. suggests that there could be multiple universes sure. is a tremendously... Uh, enlivening uh, insight. And so rather than being a whimper in terms of this universe, <laughs> it's a window on a greater reality that nobody would have had to confront in a very serious manner of science yes. fiction before this. Yeah. So well, maybe it's, a, right. it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an open window, not a closed door. Yeah, the universe doesn't have to be, or the multiverse, if there are many universes, doesn't have to be uh, uh, an embodiment of the traditional ideal of uh, of theoretical physics, or Platonism, or Spinozism, or Einsteinism, of absolutely everything has to be determined. Uh, or the orbits of the planets being perfect uh, solids, or something. Right, oh, Kepler had that idea. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, it doesn't have to be that way, and and no, it could it, absolutely it could if it, if as a consequence of other grand concepts, we learn that. The multiverse really, there really is a multiverse, and you can embed this in a rich conceptual structure. Uh, we'll learn to live with it. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll also have fun explaining the the knowledge part <laughs> and exploring whether our enlightenment is really true enlightenment or an illusion. And so, and, yeah, but yeah. but also in the in this temptation, and if it if it is, if it turns out to be real, it is. Uh, it, it is. It is. It takes the Copernican revolution in terms of, yeah, of humanity a, to a vastly different level. It expands the concept of reality. It it, it certainly t takes your breath away if to think of multiple universes. And if the yeah the if if, if we find that through this mechanism, yeah, it's fascinating. Well, it takes your breath away. It's at first. It's yeah. It's mind expanding. And yet, <laughs> it's not the same as having precise equations that you can build on and beautiful ideas of symmetry and I don't think uh, that we've become used to in so many centuries, decades of uh, brilliant progress in theoretical physics. So you're not succumbing to the temptation quite yet? Well... I'm very willing to think about it, and it's interesting, and uh, it might even be right. And oh, I, ha I, I have succumbed. In fact, I succumbed or indulged, I guess I should say, <laughs> indulged, <laughs> not uh, long before this recent popularity. Uh, this was uh, this idea of a multiverse, although in a simple form, but a sound form was implicit in uh, some ideas about axion cosmology that, that we developed way back mm. in the 70s. Um, so I'm very willing to think about, I'm not proud, I'll think about anything, but <laughs> I think more fun is, the, is actually the knowledge corner and, and, even, and even thinking more about the enlightenment bits where we can use uh, nicer mathematics <laughs> and nicer concepts. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, we don't really know whether the things that are temptations might actually belong sure. in the Enlightenment. Sure. Right? If we thought a little harder, maybe sure. we'd bring them up. 